Joining us now is Oklahoma Republican Senator James Lankford. Thank you so much for your time, Senator. But thank you. So let's go back 24 hours. A peaceful group of demonstrators were in Lafayette Park next to the White House as a result of President Trump's brief photo op in front of St. John's Church. Authorities used an irritant similar to tear gas to clear out the square. What's your response to that? Yeah, surprising on it. Obviously, the pe people are gathering peacefully to be able to protest. Uh, the president, I wish he would have gone and visit that same church early in the morning after the fire that had happened there the night before. And 60 uh, Secret Service members had been injured in the protest that had happened the night before by people throwing things at them. I mean, it's entirely reasonable for the president to be able to step out. I just wish he'd done it in the morning rather than at a time when there would have been people there and they were trying to be able to clear a crowd. People need the ability to be able to protest publicly. I think it's why you see such a large crowd there tonight. You can't tell Americans you can't do something. Uh, if you tell Americans you can't be here, you can't protest, you'll have 10 times as many show up the next time uh, because we know constitutionally we're allowed to do that. Do you have any understanding why the president went there? I mean, typically people would go to a church for a service or to pray and not to merely take a picture. Right. No, I've, I've not talked to the president about that. I would assume it's because uh, just a couple of days before uh, that church had been burned, that church had been vandalized. Uh, that's a that's a historic church for Washington, D.C. And I think it's a statement of, hey, we're not going to allow the people that are going to destroy to be able to take this away. The difficulty I have is the president just given a really good speech about unity, about gathering together, about honoring George Floyd, uh, about trying to be able to speak out for law and in order in every community and say the protesters are not all doing this. Uh, this is a select few and they need to know they're going to face consequences of the law as they should. And then I think him walking across the street distracted from the good message that he had just given at the Rose Garden. Uh, the president has threatened to deploy active military throughout the country to help calm down the protesters. A few hours ago, Mike Mullen, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs under President Obama and George W. Bush, said in an op-ed in The Atlantic, our fellow citizens are not the enemy and must never become so. Do you think that the president should be threatening to deploy active military who have not been trained to defuse protests? Well, that, I would leave that decision up to the, the president on what needs to happen on that level. I would tell you there's 17,000 National Guard that have been acti activated in 23 different states. The National Guard had been a tremendous resource uh, to our local law enforcement and assistance to the local law enforcement. Military is not a law enforcement arm. National Guard supports what happens in all of our states and in every community where the National Guard has come out, uh, they've been a help to local law enforcement. So I think that that's where I would prioritize are the men and women that are in the National Guard and the work that they're doing to be able to help our law enforcement. I do think we need to continue to pay attention to not only what was happening in front of St. John's last night, but four police officers that were shot in St. Louis, two police officers that were run over in a vehicle in New York. Uh, we had 60 Secret Service members that were injured uh, two nights before. So uh, trying to be able to provide water rather than gasoline to all of this dialogue and to do what we're trying to do today, today is Blackout Tuesday, to maintain real dialogue with everyone and to be able to say, what can we do to listen to each other is much better than trying to inflame anybody for anything on either side. And demonstrators are now considering a sit-in at the U.S. Capitol building tomorrow. Would you consider joining them? And also, what bipartisan steps do you think that Congress needs to take at this point to help address some of the protesters' concerns? Well, I don't know that I would consider sit, sitting in all day tomorrow. Obviously, I was participating in the blackout uh, Tuesday today. Uh, but I would tell you, obviously, all of us have got work to be able to do. We have a tremendous amount. That's why the Senate is in session all of this week, uh, because cover for the nation, both in this issue, in COVID-19, and a lot of foreign policy issues and nominations and things. Uh, we've got through the inspector general for the COVID-19 work uh, now. And so there's, there's a lot we still have to be able to do. Uh, but I would say there is a lot of bipartisan conversation right now. And the first thing that we can do is listen, is slow down to be able to make sure and find out what has been missed in this that we've got to be able to engage. And then to be able to reinforce the voices in my own community from Oklahoma and from around the country to make sure that we're addressing the issues. There is no one single item uh, that solves all of this. Uh, there are issues all across our country in multiple ways. While we've made a lot of progress in race relations in the last 100 years, uh, we still have a ways to go. And for those individuals that say, no, we're done with race relations in America, everything's finished, uh, I would repeat to them over and over again, we are not done. Uh, and there's a lot that still needs to be done. And that's one of the things that we can bring to this is start is repeating those voices from at home and make sure we're amplifying what they need.
Uh, you previously directed a youth ministry. Do you think, if, if you had the opportunity to have the president's ear, do you think that his reaction is the right response? And as a man of faith, what do you think, uh, if, if, again, you had that moment to talk to the president, to perhaps give him some suggestions as, as far as healing and moving forward in this country, what that might be? Well, I, I quite frankly go back to Micah 6, 8. It's a passage that says, what does the Lord require of us? And that is to act justly, which we desperately need justice right now, love, mercy, and to walk humbly. Uh, those three things are desperately needed right now. We need justice. We need mercy for people in the situations that they're in. Uh, and we need people to walk humbly. Uh, so that that's something that can increase our conversation. It's a biblical principle, uh, but it's something that we can continue to do. And if I want to bring it up to even the civil rights uh, from 50 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, said often, darkness doesn't drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate doesn't drive out hate, only love can do that. So this most basic principle that is both a scriptural principle and a great principle for our society is, if we want to be able to drive out hate in our culture, you don't just add more hate to it, that just increases the volume. If you want to decrease the volume and increase the conversation, you've got to pour love onto the top of hate. Uh, that actually does that. The, again, the biblical principle is a gentle answer turns away wrath. Uh, we need more gentle answers at this uh, gentle answers at this point and more conversation with families and individuals. And, and just want to talk for a second about the annual legislative report card from last Congress. The NAACP gave you an F saying that you voted for the organization's civil rights priorities 9% of the time. You were one of the 114 GOP members who voted against more than 90% of the NAACP's priorities as well uh, are aware, that, sadly, that this is not a new problem. Um, why haven't you and your colleagues engaged more with the NAACP in the past. So I appreciate you trying to bring something up to try to show that I'm not for racial reconciliation in a moment when we're trying to talk about racial reconciliation. I don't know what was on the NAACP scorecard. It could have been a lot of issues that are not race related. And I hope you're not implying that I haven't worked on the race relations issues when I most certainly have my entire ministry before I came into Congress, and certainly in the time I've been in Congress. So I hope there's not some secret implication that you're trying to be able to spin on Republicans on that. The fact is, I don't know what's on their scorecard. Everyone puts out a different scorecard on different issues. My focus has been on what can we do to be able to establish better relationships with people. I've shown that in my actions and in my words and how I voted over and over again. So I look forward to getting a chance to see that scorecard and see if there's anything race related on it. But I would tell you, I was an outspoken advocate for the second chance bill. Uh, that was a major priority, not only of the NAACP, but of mine as well, that that actually became law. I was a part of it, worked through that with Cory Booker, where we both had a section we were trying to be able to get done. So th there's a lot that we can do. And what I'd recommend to you and to others is, let's not find ways to divide each other and to try to be able to plant different things to be able to divide. Let's do what we should do for all of America. Let's find ways to unite and to say, what are we doing going forward and how do we solve this? looking at our past and looking forward and listening. Senator, there is nothing about this that is an attempt to be divisive. These are facts. This is what the NAACP said. This is the rating that they gave you. I was simply giving you a chance to react to them giving you an F. But I'll move on. Last question to you, if you don't mind. You repeatedly said that Americans need to engage with people who are different, even invite them over for dinner. So should the president meet with the protesters who are outside of the White House right now? And what would you advise him to say to them? Yeah, I would absolutely encourage them to do this. This is something I've done for years now, as I've said to people a very simple statement. Has your family ever invited a family of another race to your home for dinner? Because I find oftentimes people of all races will say to me, I have friends of another race, but there's never been someone from another race in my home for a meal. To me, that breaks down the barriers. It's one of the most basic things that we find is that we have, we're friendly with people of another race, but not developing friendships. And so for me, one of the challenges that I put in front of people of all races, and I have for years, is to be able to say, what are you doing to develop friendships uh, with people? And that begins most often by inviting someone to your home uh, for a meal to be able to sit down together. So I'd certainly recommend uh, that for the president as well, to be able to have any group of leaders to be able to sit down and have a long conversation. Again, a national conversation about race is not about elected political officials with cameras all around them around a big uh, conference table. That's not a national conversation on race. A national conversation on race happens at dinner tables all across America 
because race is not a legislative issue. Race and racism is a heart issue and it's a family issue and it gets passed on through a family and it only gets solved when families sit down and talk about it as a family and when you get to know families that are of dif different ethnicity and so you can get a chance to be able to develop real friendships and to be able to break down those barriers. So that's a long-term solution that starts one family at a time to be able to have a national conversation on race. National conversation, thank you for joining this conversation here tonight, Senator Lankford, we appreciate it.